This is Jerry Hesch, an orthopedic manual physical therapist from Hesch Institute in Aurora, Colorado. And I specialize in treating joints, ligaments, muscle throughout the body, and also, of course, treat the nervous system. Um, Sean is a athletic physical therapist who's had to significantly reduce his running since February. Uh, this is 2019. Um, this is October 21st. And uh, he injured himself sometime in February of this year, but he doesn't recall a specific injury. Uh, could you point to where your discomfort is in the foot? Here. Yeah, so it's primarily under the fifth metatarsal. Is that correct? Yes. The base of the fifth metatarsal. Okay, very good. Um, you also note, can you describe what you feel behind the right trochanter um, and I point to it? So I, right behind my hip bone here, I feel a little bit of discomfort, especially when I try to uh, contract the muscles in my foot to uh -huh. evert and dorsiflex, and it kind of is like a little sharp muscular pain. Okay, very good. Um, I think we'll test your abductor in a little while. Um, Let's start with the foot though. He has excellent strength throughout his foot and he has an interesting presentation in the foot. Um, it's a very rare presentation and so I'm delighted that he's allowing me to film this. And what I find in his foot is normal midfoot mobility. So when I capture the, the navicular and the cuneiforms, and then I rotate medially to pronate the midfoot. He has good mobility, good end feel. So I take up all the movement, and then I spring it, and it has a strong, uh, strong little bit of give and a little bit of recoil. Okay? Uh, he has good cuboid mobility up and down. All right? He has good superior fibular mobility. All right? Uh, he has good anterior mobility. I'm, I'm just below the knee. I'm at the fibular head, um, the top of the fibula, and that has normal yield. What's interesting is um, when we, when I evaluate anterior mobility of the bottom of the fibula, the lateral malleolus, this is more more movement than he has on the other side. Okay, so I'm calling this hypermobility of anterior glide of the lateral malleolus, and I believe that's treatable. I believe we can change that. Now I'm testing um, posterior mobility, and I can actually get a little bit of spring mobility uh, in that direction, and I'm comparing anterior spring on his right foot. I know the camera might not capture that, but uh, do you feel the difference in mobility? Can you describe this mobility when I spring your right malleolus forward? And can you describe this mobility? It feels twice as far on this side. You, it feels twice as far on the left? Uh, yes. Very good. Very good. All righty. The other thing that I found is following the base of the fifth metatarsal and capturing the base of the fifth metatarsal and stabilizing the foot. He does have good superior and inferior mobility. Um, testing inferior mobility, I'm going to call this hypermobile, but I have to compare to the other foot to actually state that. So I'm capturing the base of the fifth metatarsal on the right, and I'm going inferiorly. What do you feel? A little bit less over here. A little bit less movement. Okay. All right. So we have two directions of hypermobility, inferior glide of the fifth metatarsal and anterior glide of the lateral malleolus, okay? When I capture the fifth metatarsal and traction it anteriorly, there's no movement, okay? And when I spring it posteriorly, there's no movement either. So we have an anterior and a posterior hypomobility of the fifth metatarsal. Now when I capture the right side, what do you feel when I go forward? Movement. Okay. And what do you feel when I spring it backwards? Movement. Okay. Good. Um, the other um, finding of hypomobility is when I 
test abduction of the calcaneus. So I'm evaluating the joint below the ankle. I'm going to change that camera angle. I'm the camera guy. Um, all right. So I'm testing outward movement of the right calcaneus called eversion. And I believe the camera can see that little bit of movement there. And I push it to a stop point called taking up the slack. And then I can overpressure it. Okay, and I can also clasp that calcaneus and I can rotate the foot outward called abduction of the calcaneus. Okay, another term might be external rotation of the calcaneus. All right, on the left affected foot, I, I'm trying to push that heel medially and I don't get any movement. It's, it's, it's stuck. It's not moving. I can't take up the slack and I can't overpressure it. And when I rotate outward they get a little bit of outward movement okay but then uh, there's a hard end feel then I can't I can't spring it further whereas on the, on the right side I was able to rotate it outward and then I was able to over pressure it okay um, I'm going to just compare adduction okay so I want you to tell me how does this movement compare to this movement. Maybe slightly less. Okay. Um, which is less? Um, can you do it one more time actually? Okay. So here is adduction of the calcaneus, or you could call it internal rotation of the calcaneus. All right. Actually, I might be feeling more on this side. I feel more movement as well. So we could call that relative hypermobility. Again, that's treatable. When I restore movement in the opposite direction, then this motion will move towards the midline. It will become less hypermobile. Okay? Makes sense. All right. So um, we also evaluated the upper extrem the, the lower extremity, the hip, and we found that Sean has less internal rotation. So I can rotate the hip internally and it's important to test hip internal rotation with the person laying on their back. Sadly it hasn't been researched. Okay, but I find restrictions of hip internal rotation in this position that I do not find in sitting and I do not find in prone with the uh, a knee bent 90 degrees. Now I'm going to overpressure it, okay, and it has a hard end feel, okay. When I test internal rotation of the right side, I get distinctly greater motion. I get a, about 30 degrees of internal rotation, and then when I overpressure it, it moves much further. Okay? The other interesting thing we found was a difference in pelvic mobility. But what I think I'll do is I'll test abduction strength right now. Okay? So I'm going to I'm going to try and move this hip into adduction. We'll do it in neutral. Um, on the count of three, I want you to resist it. Give me everything you got. One, two, three, go. Yep. Okay, so I was able to break it. All right, let's do it on the right side. On the count of three, don't let me move it in. One, two, three, go. How do you compare those two? Weaker on the side. Weaker on the left. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that I found was a lack of, I can take up the slack going left to right, but then I cannot spring this. I cannot spring the pelvis to the right. And you had made a comment that you felt like you were weight bearing more with the right foot pointed outward. The left foot, yeah. Yeah. Can yes. you elaborate on that? So I feel like my hip or is externally rotated or my foot is pointing out when I walk. It's subtle, Very but good. I've noticed yeah. that. I couldn't see it, but maybe at the end of the day when you're more fatigued, maybe that's more apparent. Okay? So, um, mm -hmm. gliding the pelvis to the left, I can take up the slack and then I spring it and then it, then it moves. Okay? Um, let's have you sit up and face me and scoot over to the right so you're not sitting in the crack. Good, beautiful. Bend forward and lean on your hands. So the other thing we found was a very subtle torsion of his sacrum. 
Um, when he was lying on the stomach, it was not obvious, but when he went into flexion, it became obvious. So I'm on the PSISs, I'm right underneath the PSISs, I'm on the PSISs now. That's part of the, that's part of the ilium, okay? And so if I come medially, I'm at S2 of the sacrum, the second level, and now I'm at, at the upper level. So with my thumb, I can induce anterior motion of the whole body. The force translates through the lumbosacral facets and it, and it translates through the sacroiliac joint. Same thing on the left, okay? When I come down to S2, then I come down to S3, and now I'm at about S4-5, then it's obvious that this one, at least to me, is posterior, okay? And if I bring my thumbs together, this thumb would override the other one by about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Now I can spring with, with thumb pressure the right lower sacral quadrant, but I cannot spring the left lower sacral quadrant, okay? Now if I come underneath the ILAs of the sacrum, I find that my left thumb is lower, okay? And if I lift up, his whole body moves, okay? So motion translates through the sacroiliac joint and it translates through the lumbar spine. If I use a similar force, and now I'm even using more force, there's no movement on the left, okay? So this defines a left side bent fixation and a left rotation on a left oblique axis. The terminology I like is left lower sacral quadrant prominent and stuck, okay? I wrote a book chapter on that called Sacral Torsion. It's in Eric Dalton's book, Dynamic Body, all right? So we will treat all of these components uh, in order to treat his foot pain. And we'll teach him how to treat himself, how to maintain those gains. So I'll only need to see him twice, and the second visit will probably be a very brief visit just to make sure everything is behaving. So let's have you lie on your back now. I have found a very consistent pattern in response to the sacral torsion. Uh, the body has a riding reflex that keeps the eyes horizontal. And so it will turn on muscles somewhere else. Um, he has a restriction of rotation in the, in the pelvis, restriction of glide and restriction of sacral rotation. Um, basically, the pelvis is glided to the left and the sacrum is rotated left and the foot is rotated outward or the hip. And in response to that, I find consistently that the trunk rotates to the right such that it makes the third rib prominent on the left side. And I'm springing what I think is rib number four. And now I'm on rib number three, and I'm putting a lot of pressure, and what do you feel? No movement. No movement. What do you feel above that? Movement. Movement. Yeah, yeah. So rib, uh, if I'm correct, that's rib number three. This is two. Yeah, I could be off by one, okay? Um, but this pattern will melt. This will go away. This rib will have normal mobility after I restore movement there. The other pattern I find is that when I palpate underneath the atlas, the first vertebrae, he has much more tone in the right suboccipital muscles, and I lift up with my index finger, and I do not get movement. Okay? When I lift up on the left side, I get right rotation of the atlas. I did screen the occipitoatlanal joint, and that motion is normal on the left. So I know this is a long video, but I think it's such an interesting case. Um, I hope the I hope it's informative to some clinicians and and some clients as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and treat him. And I think what I'll do is do a part two video, and I'll demonstrate what my treatment technique is, then I'll actually treat them because it, it takes a long time, okay? Um, I'm gonna take five minutes gliding his pelvis to the right. Um, I'll also cover what the self-treatment will be for him and then I'll, then I'll film another video showing how his body reacted to the treatment and I'm gonna submit that the Directions of hypomobility will have restored motion and that the directions of hypermobility 
will become more stable. So I'll stop on this film. We're at 15 minutes. <laughs>